Hey, ladies and gentlemen. We are starting uh, our webinar. Uh, my name is Artur Nitsevic. I'm partner of uh, Interlegal Law Firm. And today uh, it's my pleasure to, um, to moderate uh, this uh, webinar, which is uh, run by Interlegal Law Firm in collaboration with uh, DPS. And uh, Leonid Windergaus uh, is going to be our first speaker. Today is our international webinar dedicated uh, to Ukraine. So uh, what are we going to present you uh, du during one uh, hour and a half? This is the time limits uh, that uh, we have. I think that we will cope uh, with the time limits. Uh, it's going to be four presentations. Uh, first, uh, Leonid Windergaus uh, from Antwerp uh, we'll start with the uh, with some implications uh, uh, on cargo recovery uh, in Ukraine in in the let's say in the region, and so we'll give you nice examples from his international practice. And then we will uh, pass uh, the baton to interlegal people, and uh, there will be three uh, more speakers: uh, attorneys at law Irina Maltseva, Taras Dragan, and Nikita Kocherba. Uh, they will cover different uh, issues uh, related to uh, recovery, cargo recovery and debt collection in Ukrainian courts, in Ukrainian uh, arbitration institutions. And also they will uh, give uh, some examples, a case study uh, uh, basing uh, on the cases that uh, we successfully uh, uh, passed uh, uh, for our clients. Again, uh, thank you very much, Leonid and DPS, for nice uh, collaboration. Before giving the first, uh, uh, the first speaker uh, the, the, the possibility to speak, I would say that uh, uh, the Black Sea region and Ukraine as a part, as a major part of a major player in the Black Sea, is continued to be a terra incognita for, uh, first of all, for Europeans, for European specialists. Uh, how uh, one of my colleagues from, the, uh, from, from Germany uh, used to say, uh, everything that is to the east uh, from the EU, this is terra incognita. And every, uh, a, a, any case that is uh, 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 related to that territory, I, I, I'm going to pass to you, Arto, because I have no idea what is going on there. And I must say that this is not only for Ukraine, this is uh, for all uh, Black Sea region. Uh, uh, Interlegal is a Black Sea law firm. We have um, uh, offices uh, all around the Black Sea, in Ukraine, in uh, Turkey, in uh, Georgia, Romania, Bulgaria, Moldova. And uh, in all these countries, the, 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 there is similar regime and uh, uh, peculiarities are more or less uh, uh, similar. Uh, a few weeks ago, by the way, we had a nice uh, webinar dedicated to subrogation and regress, very uh, specific uh, topic. Uh, and uh, there were two countries uh, represented, Turkey and Ukraine. And uh, again, uh, we came to, to the same conclusion. That's uh, very similar uh, legal uh, uh, regulations and very similar court and business uh, practice. Uh, so uh, now uh, Leonid will start uh, his uh, 15 minutes uh, for the presentation and uh, for the short uh, case study. Uh, uh, please, uh, all questions that may come out, uh, please put them uh, into the chat uh, because after the, each presentation, the speaker will be able to answer uh, your question, your questions. Anyway, we will do our best uh, to give uh, feedback to your questions uh, uh, during the web webinar or after the webinar uh, in writing. So please, uh, Leonid, the floor is yours. Uh, come on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever applies to you where you are now. 
Uh, before we start, I would like to thank uh, you all for giving me this great opportunity to speak in front of you and to deliver you my presentation. I will share my screen and hopefully everything will work. Uh, one second, please. Um, right, and we should be good to go. So uh, I would like to briefly introduce you a case study of a shipment of cereal, which gone from bad to worst. So let's take it step by step. Uh, first off, uh, who are we? Who am I to be able to, to speak with you today? Uh, I'm from company DPS. Uh, we are an international organization of surveyors and loss adjusters. We are based in Antwerp, Belgium. That's our headquarters. We have regional hubs in uh, Senegal in China and in the United States. And via those hubs and the global network of partners, we deliver global service and one-stop shop solution when it comes to your survey, claim handling, and risk management needs and solutions. Uh, we are already busy with this for give and take 20 years. And on, on an average year, we handle give and take 10,000 files. So we have seen a few things go wrong. And this is clearly one of those things which we have seen not go the way it was intended. Um, the cargo involved is a shipment of corn, corn gluten feed pellets, uh, 3,300 tons in bulk, shipped from Kherson, Ukraine to Aliaga, Turkey, uh, with a total value of give and take $600,000 CIF. The vessel selected for the shipment was this fine motor vessel, fine old lady. She is a general cargo ship of two holds and 2,450 tonnage. Uh, she is not that fresh anymore, built in 1979. She is well classed with a class which is not in IX. And by the time of the commencement of the shipment, all her statutory documents were valid and in force. However, the port state control did find some deficiencies. One was with a leaking hatch cover, and the other one, somewhat more uh, considerate maybe, would be that her deck hull was heavily rusted. Uh, as we later found out, having inspected the vessel, despite the documents being in order, there were quite some severe issues there. In particular, well, you see this on the picture, her hull uh, was rusted through. And that's, yeah, that's, that's a big red flag. So uh, let's maybe take a look at how the things evolved. On the 2nd of February uh, to the 4th of February, the cargo was loaded on the port and on the roads, all well at this stage. And on the 7th and 8th of February, she departs. Uh, not at a surprise for the region for the time of the year. The weather conditions are not so nice. Uh, she's sailing in heavy ice, and thus she's sailing in an icebreaker convoy. Uh, most of the time, she's actually not sailing, but spent anchored uh, because of the heavy ice movement. Throughout all this voyage, the crew regularly patrols the vessel, checks the ballast tanks to check if everything is in order, and as per the reports, it is. On the 8th of February at 17.30, she reaches ice-free waters and everybody thinks they can breeze out with a sense of relief, but that's a little bit premature. At 18.30, leakage is noted on hold number one. Uh, what to do? What to do? She immediately reverts from her course and proceeds to the port of Ch Ochakov, Ukraine, where she bursts on the outer roads at 22 uh, hours o'clock local time. Upon, upon anchorage, uh, the manhole to hold number one is unsealed and the cargo inside is inspected and the side they see is not very nice. As a side note, take a look at this fellow in the picture. It's minus 10, he's in water, uh, in a cargo, in the dark, uh, very miserable. And I can bet that this is the moment that he starts thinking if this was the right job for him. Um, so what to do? Not a lot of choice. They start pumping out water by a portable pump and uh, see how things develop further. On the next day morning, a diving survey is carried out, and to no surprise of anybody involved, ice damage to the hull is noted. In multiple places on both sides, the site is not that well. Uh, throughout the day of the 9th of February and the 10th of February, temporary repairs are being executed. Uh, these are very much complicated by the heavy ice movement and overall the weather conditions. The repairs are being carried out by means of applying, uh, well, Metal plates with porous rubber underneath on both sides of the bridge. Uh, this is not really a way to stop the leakage entirely, but it does help to arrest it. And on the same day of the 10th of February, we are finally able to carry out a cargo survey. So uh, hold number two, no surprises there. Everything is okay uh, because there was no issue with that hold. Hold number one, however, is a different story. First of all, they do continue pumping water. 
and uh, upon entering the hold, we note uh, that the top of the cargo is affected by uh, water damage due to leakage through the hatch covers. On its own, this would be a fairly big issue, but given what we're dealing with, this is peanuts, because in the front of the hold, we see heavy water leakage, heavy water damage. As per our estimation, about 30% of the cargo in the hold is affected, which is give and take 500 metric tons, which is give and take 100,000 USD. So uh, yeah, what to do next? Uh, and actually, not a lot can be done because normally the cargo needs to be transshipped, but due to the weather conditions, it's not that easy to organize. So for almost a month, we're waiting for the weather to be right and for a floating crane to be brought alongside the vessel. And on the 1st of March, to much relief of everybody involved, transshipment uh, does commence, and the separation of sound cargo and damaged cargo as well. However, this is also the stage where things start to slowly go from bad to worse. So um, two vessels were appointed to take on the sound and damaged cargo. For the sound cargo, uh, the parties went ahead with motor vessel tired Daredevil. She is also not a very young lady, and she's also not a very the lady not of the best of shapes. Let's put it like this. But okay, this this is the vessel that was selected. When inspecting the vessel before the loading, we noted that her holes were rusty, that her ballast tanks were leaking into the holes, and there were obvious signs of leaking hatch covers. Uh, we started discussions with the master in terms of okay, we would like to test your vessel to confirm the leaking hatch covers, or rather to confirm they're not, Master strongly refuses. This is another red flag on its own. But there is not a lot of choice, so discussions ensue, and after some time spent in these discussions, repairs are carried out to the extent which is possible, and the transshipment goes ahead. Um, it would be nice if this would be the end of the problems, but it wasn't, because uh, we noted that uh, the ballast sounding pipes were out of order in the vessel and the ballast tank calibration tables were missing. What this means in practical terms is that the draft survey would be very inaccurate. We did what we could and as per the estimation, about 2,600 metric tons of sound cargo with, were reloaded on this vessel. So, so far so good. In the meantime, <clears throat> sorry, motor vessel Rusty Helper was appointed to take on the cargo, the damaged cargo, which was found in hold number one. As with the previous vessel, she is not the youngest of the ladies and she is not most fit. Uh, her holes were rusty, but given that the purpose of the vessel, this was not so much so big of an issue. So repairs were carried out as to the extent possible. And again, reloading commenced. And yeah, the cargo was being reloaded. First, the sound part was transshipped and separated in the holds of the rusty helper. Then we went ahead with the uh, more or less damaged cargo, so to say the semi-damaged cargo, and then finally the heavily damaged cargo in the front of the hold, this slushy substance, substance if you will, was reloaded. Um, the problem was, as with the previous vessel, that the draft marks were missing in some places of the vessel and the ballast tank calibration tables were missing. Same issue, same result, draft survey inaccurate. As for our best estimation, give and take 700 metric tons were transloaded, this off cargo and water. Uh, well, you know, it's not ideal, but circumstances were what they were and things had to be done. So after the cargo was reloaded, Motor Vessel Tired there, they will send sails to the original destination of the cargo in Turkey. On the 20th of March, she arrives there. After some discussions on the next day, the cargo is discharged. And to much of relief of everybody involved, give and take 2,600 metric tons are landed. So no shortage is declared and no damage is claimed. Success overall for this part of the cargo, at least. But then there is the other part. Um, on the 11th of March, after taking on board the damaged cargo, motor vessel Rusty Helper sails. But at that time, she has no discharge port in sight because nobody really knows what is to be done. The first idea is to try and sell the cargo in a salvage sail, and this in Romania in Constanza. So uh, on the 17th of March, vessel arrives at Constanza Roads and uh, drops anchor there. So in the meantime, the uh, search for salvage buyer continued, but unfortunately, very, very fast, it became clear that nobody would be willing to buy the cargo. However, there was a solution. There was a company willing to take it over for free and then do whatever they wished with it afterwards, which was, given the circumstances, a good enough solution. So on the 27th of, of March, discussions with the buyer, buyer are completed, and everybody seems to be good to go. So on the 4th of April, authorities permit the sale to take place. On the 6th of April, the vessel is burst, uh, her holes are opened, and everybody's very disappointed with what they see. The cargo is in terrible state. 
it's wet, it's moldy, it's caked, it's smelling not very pleasant. And uh, yeah, it doesn't look that well. And frankly speaking, it's not very surprising because apparently during the entire uh, transportation, the entire saving of the cargo in the vessel, which was given take about one month, no ventilation took place. Wet cargo, closed environment, no ventilation, things are about to go wrong. Uh, so, having seen this, authorities discuss internally a little bit, and on the next day, on the 7th of April, they prohibit discharge. So, Romania is out of the question. What to do next? So, the search ensues, and uh, unfortunately, the only solution found seems to be to destroy the cargo, and this in Ukraine, inland. So, for this, the cargo would need to be delivered to the Ukrainian port, discharged, delivered inland, and destroyed there. So, uh, for this, a permission of the local authorities is needed. So, uh, an application is made, and again, discussions start. Discussions last for give and take a month, and eventually, after long discussions, the customs refuse. Why? It's a bit of a complicated story, but eventually it boils down to there not being an appropriate customs regime under which this cargo could be declared, so it became too complicated. So what to do? Uh, not real, not real solution in sight. Um, Back in the time during the discussions, an offer was received for the cargo to be destroyed in Cyprus, but this offer was very expensive and that's why it was initially refused. But given that we're out of options, we're out of options and grudgingly this offer is eventually accepted. So on the 12th of May, uh, after the Ukrainian offer is rather the Ukrainian solution is finally refused, the Cyprus solution is accepted and the vessel sails there. Uh, on the 9th of June, motor vessel Rusty Helper with the cargo of with the cargo of the damaged cereal on board arrives at Larnaca, and again discussions with the uh, local authorities commence. Uh, luckily, it doesn't take them that long, and after a few days, on the 15th of June, authorities approve that the cargo can be disposed and the goods would be used for production of methane gas. Sometime later, 28th of June, the uh, Cyprus customs permit for the cargo to be discharged. On the same day, immediately the discharge operations commence, the cargo is finally discharged and handed over, and five months after the event, the operational side of the story is over. Everybody breathes out with much relief. As you can imagine, given how um, much time and effort was needed to bring this afloat, uh, the costs would be fairly significant. First of all, the value of the cargo lost was give and take about 100,000 USD, uh, which, so to say, uh, in the grand scheme of things, is not that, not that much. Then the transshipment costs to reload the cargo from the damaged vessel onto two substitute vessels were about $50,000. Then you had the expenses for the motor vessel tire Daredevil, the one that delivered the sound cargo, which was $75,000. Then you had the expense of the Rusty Helper, the one which was involved with the damaged cargo, which was another $200,000. Then you had the destruction costs in Cyprus, which were another $75,000. And then on top, you had a minor fraction for the other fees, such as legal, forwarding, and other expenses. So all in all, this boils down to a little bit above half a million dollars which, given that the entire value of the card was only 600, well, only was $600,000, is very much considerable. So, yeah, it was a fairly expensive exercise. So, what happens next? The next step would be the recovery uh, from the liable carrier, which in this particular case would not be that straightforward because uh, while the vessel was clearly not in order, her statutory documents were in order. And uh, one would maybe try to, so to say, find something whether she was in any violation of, of her restrictions for ice navigation. But unfortunately, as per the class documents, the ice navigation restrictions or allowances were formulated in a very vague way. So it would also be a big discussion there. So the bottom line here is for the next step, you really may want to have a good partner who would be able to assist you in bringing this home. Um, this is basically briefly what I would like to share for you with you. I thank you very much for listening to me. I thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions or comments, you're most welcome. Uh, thank you, Leonid, very much for your wonderful presentation. Because I, why I say wonderful, because this is, you know, a very typical case uh, for Ukraine and other Black Sea countries. This is just uh, what happens uh, from time to time here in the region. Uh, 
Uh, I got to, uh, one question uh, sure. uh, to, to you. Please explain um, explain the business uh, of, of DPS. What is your best? Uh, what are you doing best? Because right. you are you are, you are renowned for international activities, but of course you have uh, your own offices uh, not in every part uh, of the world. So, uh, when, you know, in other words, when you say that you need a good partner, one needs a good partner. What does this mean uh, um, um, as related to the DPS? Right. So maybe this, this would be something that I should have started from, but okay, better late than never. Uh, so what we do, we are a uh, kind of a international survey organization. So we are there for all your survey, place handling, risk management and similar needs. But uh, the business model is such that we don't really own local offices at every part of the world, right? We do have a few in key locations. As I mentioned, it's in Africa, it's in Europe, it's in Africa, it's in Asia, and it's in the States. And by this, we're able to cover the entire globe. And we have a local trustworthy partner in every, so to say, interesting hub at any location of the world who we have trained over the years, who has been working with us for many years, who works as per our standards, and who delivers the work that we need them to deliver as per the requirements of our client, right? And in this context, uh, whatever may be lacking by the local expert is compensated by the experts in-house within DPS. So we act as a sort of a liaison function in between the client, wherever they may be, and the local expert, wherever they may be. And by being in the center of this global network allows us to gather knowledge from all types of trades and bring them together to one fine package uh, to deliver a product which is up to the standards of the client, regardless of uh, where the survey takes place, which uh, in some cases may become crucial. And what is also, and this is this example would actually be a very good example of the added value that DPS can create, because instead of going to a surveyor in every single port which was involved in Ukraine, one port in Ukraine, second port in Romania, in Cyprus, somewhere else, you can go just a single location to DPS, and then we take care of all the global operations for this for this adventure, and we could oversee and did oversee the entire picture. Yes, so it's a, it's an idea of a single window. It's, a, it's a working as a hub, uh, exactly. picking up uh, your relations uh, everywhere in the world, uh, to, and thus uh, bring the value to the client. Correct. It's a one-stop shop solution, if you wish. Uh, Leonid, thank you very much. No more questions at this stage. Probably they, they will appear later on or Most even welcome. after the webinar, after we will distribute uh, uh, the records uh, to all registered uh, delegates. Thank you. Uh, Irina, you, uh, you are the, our next speaker. Irina Maltsova, please uh, turn on. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Artur. Thank you, Leonid, for inter uh, interesting and useful presentation. Uh, dear colleagues, good day. We are glad to see you at our webinar. And today we will talk about cargo recovery and debt collection in Ukraine. Before we uh, get to the essence of the webinar, uh, please let me introduce our firm first. We are interlegal law firm specialized in transport, shipping, and trade. Interlegal has more than 25 years of practice. Uh, we have 29 associated offices all over the world. Our statistics so shows that 70% um, of disputes uh, settled in amicable way by means of the claims handling. Uh, more than 500 clients uh, choose us as their legal uh, representative and uh, our clients entrust us more than 1000 uh, cases annually. Uh, and of course, our clients are priority for us. So we work um, on base 24 hours per seven days. Uh, Interlegal has uh, own offices in Black Sea region, uh, which are located in Ukraine, Turkey, Moldova, Romania, Bulgaria, and Georgia. So we uh, have uh, opportunity to provide you with our services in different countries, not only in Ukraine. So what are we going to talk about today? 
the first block will be how to recover debts in Ukrainian courts, whether it, it, it is possible to um, obtain the money, your money, and uh, what actions uh, um, must be taken in order to uh, obtain the positive result. Uh, second block is recognition and enforcement proceeding in Ukraine. And third uh, block, International uh, Commercial Arbitration Court of Ukraine and the Ukraine Maritime Arbitration Commission peculiarities and of procedure. So the speakers of today's webinar. Uh, my name is Irina Maltseva. I am a lawyer and attorney at law of interlegal law firm, and I will present you the first block. My colleague Taras Dragon, who is lawyer of interlegal law firm, will present you the second block. And uh, Nikita Kocherba, who is lawyer and attorney at law of uh, interlegal law firm, will present you the third block. So, how to recover debts in Ukrainian courts? What uh, actions uh, must be taken in order to reach the positive decision and to you uh, obtain your uh, money? Uh, before the court proceeding, it is important to say, uh, to tell you about claims handling, such tools as uh, claims handling. We believe that uh, this uh, tool helps our client to save their time and their money. Uh, of course, before proposal of uh, this um, tool, we uh, conduct a brief uh, due diligence of the debtor in order to find out whether this uh, debtor uh, uh, is able to pay your debt. Um, under this stage, we analyze the documents, develop the legal um, position, uh, prepare a um, claim, uh, and uh, conduct the negotiation with the debtor under this dispute. Of course, there is uh, some risk that the debtor will deny our claim and we will be forced to go to the court. Uh, about court proceeding, we will talk about, uh, in more details. De depend on the category of uh, case and parties uh, of the case, uh, the dispute can be uh, considered in commercial, civil, and administrative courts. For example, if we are talking about uh, purchase contract between uh, two entities and dispute arose from the uh, quality and quantity of the cargo, uh, this uh, case should be considered in uh, commercial court. If um, uh, there is some dispute between individuals, for example, divorce or inheritance or um, uh, payment uh, for children, uh, we will go to civil court. And the administrative court uh, considers case uh, against the state body. For example, if uh, there is some customs order regarding customs penalties uh, and you disagree with this order, you have the right to go to administrative court for appeal. We handle different uh, categories of cases, but as our practice shows, uh, the um, dispute from the commercial relations occur more often. So today we will talk about uh, case consideration in commercial court and what you uh, have to do in order to obtain recovery under this uh, dispute. So commercial court proceeding commenced. Uh, Ukrainian legislation says that uh, there are two stages, a preparatory proceeding and consideration on the merits. Um, preparatory proceeding is uh, like uh, a preliminary proceeding in uh, England, uh, English courts. So under this uh, stage, uh, parties apply to um, uh, file all application, panel, uh, petitions, uh, motions, uh, evidences to the court. Uh, they um, initiate uh, all possible examination, initiate witnesses statements, uh, etc. So this uh, stage is about um, collection of all possible uh, evidences in order to prove and ground your legal position. And um, 
Also, our legislation um, gives uh, the right for the party to the party to uh, conclude the settlement agreement at this stage. For example, if uh, parties um, reach some agreement at this stage of court proceeding, uh, it's not a problem to uh, finish the court proceeding um, by uh, filing the draft of settlement agreement to the judge, and judge may approve or deny the settlement agreement. Uh, denial. Um, uh, denial can be due to some violation of the rights of one of the party. Uh, so you uh, have all a uh, right to solve uh, your dispute in amicable way, even at the stage of court proceeding. Consideration on the merits uh, is about, um, uh, it's when the judge considers uh, the case based on all evidences collected at the preparatory proceeding. So um, Ukrainian legislation says that um, no more evidences can be filed to the court, but the evidences which um, uh, cannot be filed due to some relevant reasons at the preparatory proceeding. So uh, if you uh, would like to file new evidences at the, at the stage of consideration uh, on the merits, uh, you must um, explain the judge why you uh, wouldn't be able uh, didn't have the opportunity to file these uh, evidences at the preparatory proceeding otherwise um, judge will deny your evidences also it's important to say about claims handling um, as per Ukrainian legislation, uh, the debtor must not uh, wait for court consideration, uh, but he must try to solve uh, the dispute in amicable way at the pre-trial stage. Uh, so it's not an obligation for all categories cases. Uh, but in Ukraine, there are some categories of cases when the pre-trial pre stage is uh, the required condition. For example, when we are talking about uh, dispute from road transportation, uh, the uh, pre-trial uh, stage must be conducted. Moreover, the party must provide together with a lawsuit uh, the court with the evidences that the pre-trial stage was conducted but failure. Uh, otherwise, uh, judge may um, could just pro, uh, just uh, uh, even not accept your lawsuit uh, for consideration without uh, such evidences of pretrial stage. Uh, so decision, uh, the development of cases uh, can be in two ways. Uh, for example, uh, the judge satisfied your lawsuit and the enforcement proceeding is the next stage. About enforcement proceeding, we will talk uh, more in detail later. And uh, when judge refused to satisfy uh, your um, lawsuit, in this case, if you disagree with uh, the decision of the judge, in this case, you have the right to go to appeal with the relevant application. Uh, and uh, uh, if uh, appeal court uh, also uh, refuse to satisfy your application, you have a right to go to concession court. Uh, concession court is uh, the uh, Supreme Court and the highest, um, uh, highest um, instantion or in the court system. Uh, or, for example, the concession court satisfied your application. So the enforcement proceeding can be commenced from the moment when the um, court decision entered into force. It's important to say that um, under the appeal proceeding, when the appeal decision was rendered, uh, the, this decision entered into force once uh, it was uh, rendered. So you can commence the enforcement proceeding uh, at that moment. However, uh, as the party have the right to go to concession court and you in, uh, initiate the enforcement proceeding at that time, the executor will suspend the enforcement proceeding till the concession court render the decision under this case. So, um, 
there is a strict term to be observed. All party, uh, parties uh, have uh, file uh, all application lawsuits documents uh, appeal in time in due time in order to um, secure their rights uh, if you um, violated these terms uh, you just deprive your right for appeal for concession and uh, for a legal court proceeding uh, uh, as well so um, Ukrainian court system provides the party with all possible tools in order to uh, their violated rights to be uh, restored and uh, um, the party obtained the positive uh, um, decision. Uh, of course, as in every different countries, we have strict rules and strict terms um, the party shall met. But uh, as per our um, practice, we highlight three uh, key points. First of all, all uh, documents must be uh, filed to the court in time uh, in order to avoid the uh, judge uh, denies your um, documents, your evidence for uh, formal reasons. Second is um, uh, all um, evidences must be sufficient and relevant. Otherwise, uh, the counterparty will object them. And third, uh, you must uh, uh, use your procedural uh, rights in good faith, uh, otherwise the judge will, um, judge approval will be in, not in your favor. Uh, enforcement proceeding. Uh, enforcement proceeding can be conducted via private executor and state executor. Both of them have uh, the equal rights for uh, enforce enforcement uh, uh, of the court decision. Um, however, we always recommend our clients to conduct uh, the enforcement uh, of the court decision via uh, private executor as uh, this option is uh, uh, much more faster than via uh, state executor. So as per Ukrainian legislation, uh, you have three years for filing the court decision to the executor for enforcement. Um, uh, three years from the moment when the uh, decision entered into force. Uh, the execu executors have the rights uh, to obtain all information regarding assets and property of the debtor from different, um, different uh, registered, uh, different ways. Uh, and. Um, uh, any property can be arrested, uh, but only if there is no, uh, there are no uh, some limits on this uh, property. The arrested uh, property can be sold in auction, and the obtain money for this property can be uh, will is to be remittance to the creditor. Um, also, the executor has a right uh, to read off money from the debtor's bank account in favor of the creditor. Uh, so, in case if um, in case the debtor um, obtain the money on his bank account on regular basis, uh, the all amount of debt can be collected by this uh, way. A term of uh, uh, enforcement proceeding is different. Um, in best scenario, uh, the court can be enforced in one month, but there are a lot of cases when enforcement proceeding lasts for a month, uh, years. Um, so it depends on the um, how complicated uh, uh, case is. Uh, let's consider some cases. It was a purchase case for a supply of hot uh, rolled coins. Um, seller uh, shipped uh, the relevant cargo in time and uh, cargo documents uh, were issued and sent to buyer. Uh, as per uh, contract provisions, the payment is to be made partly. So 30% before the loading of cargo and 70% uh, once 
once the cargo documents are received by the buyer. As you already understand, um, buyer didn't make a payment, uh, but he asked for the extension in one month and issued a guarantee letter that he make a payment uh, in due time. Uh, however, um, he didn't. Uh, so seller applied to us for the help and we commenced the work. Uh, at the stage of claims handling, uh, the buyer just ignored us, uh, didn't respond uh, on our uh, claims and we were forced to go to the court. Um, at the court proceeding, judge satisfied us uh, our uh, lawsuit uh, but the buyer um, were disag was disagree with this decision and go to appeal court uh, however it didn't uh, help him because uh, we uh, had a strong position and strong evidences so appeal court uh, refused to satisfy the application of the buyer uh, based on the court decision the enforcement proceeding was commenced and our client received the payment in full within one uh, within six a month. Uh, one more case with some differences. It also was uh, the contract um, purchase contract for supply of steel plates. Uh, this time our client was the buyer. Uh, as per contract provisions, uh, the payment uh, is to be made uh, in advance and uh, buyer uh, fulfill his obligation and made the payment, but the cargo wasn't shipped. Uh, we recommend the claims handling and uh, uh, provided uh, conducted uh, the long term negotiation with the seller. Uh, but the seller said that, uh, oh, uh, I just uh, has not received your money on my bank account. So that's why I didn't ship the cargo. Uh, but we had the evidences that the money was uh, on his account and he received uh, the money in time. Um, despite that, uh, seller didn't want to solve this um, case amicably at the stage of claims handling, so we went to the court. Uh, at the preparatory stage, um, seller understood that he has no chances to win this case and uh, he will lose more. Uh, so he uh, offered us to conclude uh, an amicable um, settlement agreement. Uh, we prepared a draft of settlement agreement filed to the court. Court appro uh, judge approved it and uh, our client uh, received uh, the payment in full uh, within one week. So, as you see, uh, court, uh, um, court system, our Ukrainian legislation provides uh, different parties with uh, as claim, claimant and, uh, and as a defendant uh, with the tools uh, to secure their rights. But of course, there are some strict provisions uh, you have met. Uh, and once more, three points of um, successful uh, consideration of the court in order to obtain the uh, good uh, decision. First, please do all in time. Uh, file all evidences, all documents in time. Second, uh, all evidences must be relevant and sufficient. And third, use your procedural rights in good faith. Of course, the lawyer will act on behalf of of you uh, at the court proceeding, but the most important thing that you as the client provide uh, provides the uh, lawyer with all possible uh, documents and evidences. And even if you thinks that a uh, thing that um, it's not a useful document, uh, it uh, can't help us. Believe me, uh, there is a lot of there are a lot of cases when uh, such documents can help you to uh, resolve this um, issue, this dispute in your favor. So, 
uh, that's all. Thank you for attention. Uh, please, if you have some question or uh, um, pos uh, possible case or you need advice, uh, please do not hesitate to contact me. You can see my contact details on this slide and I will provide you with a response or uh, some consultation. Thank you for attention. Have a nice day and uh, Taras, the floor is yours. Uh, good day, colleagues. Uh, my name is Taras Dragan. I am an interlegal firm lawyer. And uh, uh, let us talk without you about the, some specific issues and procedure of recognition and enforcement of decision of international arbitrations and the foreign court in Ukraine. Uh, let's start with the minimal theory. Uh, Ukraine, uh, like uh, most countries in the world, is a party uh, to the New York Convention on uh, Recognition and of Foreign Arbitral Awards. And the provisions of these conventions are implanted in the national procedural legislation of Ukraine. Uh, it means uh, that Ukraine can be active participant in any international business relations. Uh, and we understand, uh, we all understand, and uh, we are, as a lawyer understand that the real goal uh, of any clients, our clients, is to obtain uh, funds, its money, or their uh, counterparty to fulfill their obligations. And winning the case in court or arbitrations does not mean anything in itself. And uh, the legendary cash is the king is relevant in this matter as well. Um, uh, how you see it. And uh, uh, so under what conditions can you implement the decisions on the territory of Ukraine? In fact, uh, there are uh, only two such conditions, but as practice shows, this enough to effective uh, protect of interest of our clients. Uh, the first uh, uh, one is simple. If your debtor registered or actually located in Ukraine, you can enforce uh, and recognize first a decision against him in Ukraine. Uh, it's clear that generally the debtors in this case are Ukrainian legal entities with registered location in Ukraine. Uh, however, there are interesting cases when, the, when we can justify the possibility of going to the court in Ukraine uh, due to the actual conduct of the debtor's business in Ukraine, uh, but without official legislation, yes. And uh, it means that they uh, may be uh, cases when your debtor is foreign legal entity registered, for example, in, in Panama, uh, which has no property in Ukraine, but actually does business in Ukraine. For example, rents an office, uh, fulfill contracts. Uh, there's a large uh, probability uh, that with uh, proper uh, justification, you will be able to recognize and enforcement the decision against uh, such person in Ukraine. And in fact, uh, in uh, these cases, is many subsequent ones, uh, there's uh, um, some awards that each case is, in, is individual and uh, the reality of achieving and positive result, results depends on the situation and professionalism of the preparatory work. Uh, the next one, uh, sorry. Uh, the next uh, grounds is uh, existence of property uh, belonging to the debtor on the territory of Ukraine. For example, if the debtor has real estate, land, or car in Ukraine, you can safely apply to the Ukrainian court for the uh, uh, recognition and enforcement of the decision on, against such debtor. But uh, uh, the practice always uh, also allows to establish ambiguous ways to resolve this issue 
such as possibility of recognition decision when the debtor in Ukraine has, uh, for example, shares in another company or his vessel has entered the port of Ukraine. Uh, we will speak uh, about one of such situation in detail in the part of description of our practice cases. Uh, next. Uh, okay. Uh, next, uh, we'll discuss what documents are needed to apply to the court in Ukraine. Uh, as uh, promised, I will repeat that each situation is individual, and we will describe only general requirements that you are forced to fulfill in any cases. Uh, the first document uh, is decision itself. The best option, if you have, uh, is decision in the original. Uh, the decision may uh, take legal force, which must be noted or indicated directly or in the text of this decision. Uh, the following documents uh, is a document uh, certifying that the party against whom the decision was rendered or, and who did not participate in the trial was duly notified of the date, time and place of the hearing. For example, uh, the International Commercial Arbitration at Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Ukraine issue relevant certificates with evidence that opponents have uh, received all documents during the proceedings. Uh, also, uh, when applying for recognition of the arbitration awards itself, uh, the specific some documents is a provision of the original of arbitration agreement uh, or copy of this agreement, uh, not notarized copy. Uh, this means the court must verify that the arbitral tribunal had jurisdiction to hear the case in which the award was made. Uh, these all documents, uh, it's all principal documents uh, that we needed uh, to apply to the court in Ukraine. Uh, uh, next, let us talk about the following, where to go in Ukraine. As you can see, we have uh, uh, different requirements and approaches to enforcing the decision of arbitration and national courts. Also, the principle remains the same. Uh, however, an important uh, clause is that only key of court of appeal uh, regardless of the debtor's place of regist uh, registration or location, must apply uh, for a commercial arbitration award. Uh, it's our rule uh, in Ukraine. And uh, if we apply for recognition of the decision of a local foreign court, for example, German, uh, in Ukraine, it will be local court uh, depending on the local or the debtor or his property. And uh, uh, for example, from Odessa, if the debtor is registered in the Primorsky district of Odessa, then uh, for recognition of the decisions against him, we have to apply to the Primorsky district court of Odessa. Uh, next, uh, it's uh, also important uh, to note that you uh, have some time periods, it's uh, three years for everything, uh, it's time bar. Uh, we have a practice of extending this period, but please, uh, this is such an ambiguous issue and that we have recommended not to procrastinate and not to take risk once again. It's uh, really principle and uh, as practice shows. Uh, next, uh, then we move on to the most interesting practical uh, cases and uh, details that are known to solve everything. Uh, our case, uh, the background uh, to this case is that the parties entered into maritime loan agreement worth about 500,000 US dollars. It's, uh, it's not typical agreement, and uh, but uh, uh, but next, uh, in fact, how you, how you can see, uh, it was a certain scheme of vessel repair and fraud payment, but in fact, there was an agreement which the debtor has not fulfilled either formally 
or in fact the actual agreements between the parties. Um, uh, the arbitration clause in the quarter uh, provided uh, for the need to apply to the London Maritime Arbitration Association. There is the case was considered quickly and professionally. Our colleagues uh, was made the best. Uh, so we were faced with the issue of recognition the decision of the international commercial arbitration regarding the debtor. Uh, who was uh, registered in the offshore zone, had no property at all, except one vessel, how you see. Uh, and uh, we understand that a client wants to get his money, but uh, the debtor is registered, how I say, in offshore zone. And uh, it was a question for us, a little. And uh, uh, so what's the solutions? And we will be able to find solution to this issue. And uh, we saw that the procedural uh, law in Ukraine uh, stipulates that the debtor's property must be in uh, his possession at the time of applying to the court, but does not to establish that they must have such property at the time of consideration the decision in the court. It's a little strange, it's a little uh, crazy, but and such a period, usually two, two to three months. And uh, 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 interlegal team, uh, we understand that we have to do a miracle. It's clear that we uh, wanted to apply for recognition of the arbitration award on the basis of the arrival of uh, a vessel in any port of Ukraine. It seems that we have come up with everything perfect. Uh, what is left for us to do? Uh, hope, yes, hope. <laughs> In fact, we are talking about the hope that such a vessel will one day call to the port of Ukraine and hope that the judges uh, who will consider our issue will not think that we are a little crazy and will, and will consider our application even so it will be the first president in Ukraine. And uh, 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 what happened? Uh, uh, pro property in Ukraine is a vessel uh, that entered the port of Odessa for loading. And parallel, we wanted to arrest the ship. We understand that it's a, we have to do it. And uh, two miracles happened. The first vessel entered the port of Odessa for loading. And while the vessel was uh, on its way to Ukraine, we submitted two uh, prepared applications. First, there is recognition, recognition of the decision of international commercial arbitration in Ukraine. And second, the arrest of the vessel as security for future enforcement of the court decision. Uh, and the court considered our statements and agreed with them. And firstly, we were, we were able to enforce uh, the decision on the territory of Ukraine. And secondly, we received an arrest vessel uh, with which we put over all depths of our client. Uh, we uh, can take it without uh, salt of the vessel uh, with a settlement agreement with our uh, debtor. Uh, in fact, we have an unrealistically large number of cases of the recognition of large and principal decisions on the territory of Ukraine. We recognized the arbitration award of 1 million euro for paid but not delivery uh, products. Uh, we currently recognize a similar decision worth more than 3 million US dollars and uh, recognized uh, the decision of local German courts to recover from the Ukrainian carrier uh, payments uh, due to loss of cargo. Uh, by this, we uh, mean that uh, in this issue, uh, there is a place both for uh, professional creativity and for detailed repeat uh, acts uh, of our skills. We will not uh, tell you all these cases, because they have one essence and one ending. We have successfully recognized all these decisions. Um, 
uh, I wish you uh, all the best, uh, uh, good health, and I hope we will cooperate. If you have uh, any questions, to feel yourself free, and uh, I will be back with my answer. Uh, next is Nikita Kocherva. Nikita. Dear colleagues, participants, good day. Uh, I'm pleased to spend this time with you and uh, tell you something useful and interesting. Uh, since I'm a lawyer for contract and arbitration department at Interlegal, uh, today uh, I will talk about arbitration institutions that exist in Ukraine. So let's start. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you all know reputable uh, arbitration such as GAFTA, POSFA, LMA, and LCIA. Uh, but uh, at the level with them in Ukraine exists International Commercial Arbitration Court and uh, Maritime Arbitration Commission. I want to say that uh, both data of the Institute operate uh, within the framework of the Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce and uh, Industry. And next, uh, my aim, and I want to tell you what they are different from each other and uh, what advantages they have compared to the state courts. So if we talk about uh, Maritime Arbitration Commission, it resolves disputes uh, that arise from merchant navigation. Uh, for example, uh, in particular, the Maritime Arbitration Commission resolves disputes arising from the relationship, for example, charterers and uh, sea transportation of goods. It could be sea towing, maritime insurance or reinsurance, uh, relationship uh, related to the sale, pledge and repair of the vessels, agency of the vessels, and relationships related to the collision of the sea vessel and uh, damages caused by the ship vessel, and so on. Uh, if we talk uh, uh, regarding International Commercial Arbitration Court, it considers disputes in the field of the civil law relations arising in the implementation of foreign trade and other types of international economic relations. Uh, in particular, International Commercial Arbitration Court resolves disputes arising from uh, sale delivery of goods, performance of works, provision of service, exchange of goods and or service uh, uh, of international economic relations. Yeah, it, it should be international. So uh, given our long-standing practice, uh, we can uh, confidently state that arbitration in Ukraine has a number of advantages over national courts. Uh, now on your screen, you see our top seven advantages of arbitration over national court. Uh, first one is business priority. This means that the dispute is considered primarily in a language understandable to business. Uh, while national courts speak the language of law, which is often incomprehensible to company management. The next one is uh, expediency of consideration. As a rule, the duration of the dispute in arbitration is from three to six months. Uh, but if we talk uh, about uh, national courts, only uh, the first instantion uh, will consider approximately not less than six months. The next advantage is possibility of forming the composition of arbitrators. So the parties is independently determine, determine the arbitrators. And uh, this is the most effective guarantee of the independence of uh, arbitrators. Uh, the next one, finality of the decision. Yes, a decision rendered by an uh, arbitral tribunal uh, cannot be appealed as opposed to possible appeals and concession proceedings before national courts. Um, the next one advantage is a efficient execution system. Yes, uh, arbitral award can be enforced in 149 countries without any problems, and we have the positive practice. Um, 
the last but not least is uh, confidentially of legal proceedings. Yes, this advantage is one of the key um, advantages of arbitration uh, for companies uh, for which is very important to maintain trade secrets. Um, and the last one, a choice of the right and language of the hearing. Uh, yes, in arbitrage, it's possible to choose the right which will be applied in the event of the uh, dispute and choose exactly what is in their best interests. So, however, uh, in order to, <clears throat> to be eligible for arbitration, the parties must provide for this right in the contract. Now on the screen, you see the recommended clauses that uh, confer competence on arbitration institutes. So you can uh, I don't know, make a photo, screen it uh, for, for future. Um, so we got uh, uh, acquainted with the basic uh, concepts. And now I want to tell you how this institutions work in practice uh, using the example of two our uh, cases. The first one, uh, it uh, concern our client is a seller under the purchase contract, seeing, uh, seeing the contract for supply 3000 metric tons of sunflower meal uh, on safe terms uh, from Ukraine to Turkey. Uh, as you know, one of the essential conditions of the contract is the quality of the goods. Uh, consequently, the parties agreed on the following uh, uh, quality indicators, which you now see on the screen. Uh, in fulfilling the purchase contract, our client enters into a transshipment agreement with the terminal and the sense application for acceptance of the goods, including by quality indicators. Uh, according to the transshipment agreement, the terminal was responsible for the quality and the quantity of the goods uh, and uh, the customer's cargo. So the cargo was brought to the territory of the terminal, stored for the accumulation of shipment. Then the cargo was loaded into the vessel. And in the process of transportation, it became known that the cargo did not meet the contract quality by protein. Uh, in this case, the buyer refused to accept the goods at the port of shipment. So the parties failed to settle the dispute uh, peacefully and uh, arbitration was initiated in the GAFTA. During the arbitration process, the parties reached a common understanding and uh, it was agreed that the discount of uh, $1,400 would be an acceptable solution for both of parties in which the seller would give the goods and the buyer would accept them. Uh, considering that the terminal uh, accept goods with the proper quality, issued non-contract quality, uh, and was responsible for the quality under, under the transshipment contract, uh, we prepared uh, a claim against the terminal. Uh, the terminal did not agree with the claim since uh, the transshipment contract contained an arbitral clause. The dispute uh, was referred to uh, International Commercial Arbitration Court to its consideration. So as a result, the arbitration court agreed with our arguments and satisfied the lawsuit in full. What was convenient uh, in this case? The first one that the case was considered in one court hearing. Uh, one of the parties took part uh, in the court hearing online. It was ability to receive and send documents online. Also the most important thing in this case uh, was that our, uh, arbitration court drew attention not only to provisions of the contract, but also to the commercial actions that were done by each of the parties. Uh, next case uh, regarding uh, an agreement was concluded between the shipyard, our client and uh, ship manager for the repair of the vessel. Uh, all work were completed in full 
and done in the way uh, and the part of the payment was received part of the payment was installments so the vessel left the shipyard the payment schedule was repeatedly violated by the manager and the owner and in this connection uh, the shipyard demand to pay off the debt uh, in the full uh, the claim was not satisfied with the time uh, bar um, that's uh, out in uh, claim and therefore arbitration proceeding were initiated in maritime arbitration commission a feature of this contract was that the ship repair contract uh, was concluded by manager but on behalf of ship owner you can see this on on the screen it's a real, a real contract in this case so uh, the ship owner was not de facto bound uh, by the provisions of the repair contract and the arbitration clause but the arbitral tribunal engaged him as a defendant in the case uh, since the URA contract was concluded uh, on for on and on his behalf. Moreover, this issue was not uh, any dispute for arbitration and the decision was not made and the and decision was made as quickly and uh, confidently as possible. So as a result, the arbitration decided to collect the entire amount of debt from the ship owner. And uh, once again, this process, uh, it was quickly, it was convenient, and it was as competent as possible. Uh, thus, we are fully confident in recommending Maritime Arbitration Commission and International Commercial Arbitration Court as a competent and reliable institution for resolving disputes. Uh, Dear colleagues, that's all. I thank you for your attention, for your participation, for your time. Uh, if you have any question, my mail is on the slide. Please do not hesitate to write me and I will be happy to answer all your questions. And uh, I will give the floor to Artur Nitsevich. Uh, thank you once again and bye bye. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nikita. Uh, as a brief summary, uh, again, uh, let me thank uh, our collaboration partner DPS and Leonid Windergaus uh, for their in in for their input. Uh, I think that uh, by timeline uh, we are just in time. That was uh, our uh, task uh, to give very briefly uh, a snapshot of what's going on here in Ukraine as for cargo recovery and debt collection. And I think that uh, we have fulfilled this task because there were many, many examples, uh, practical examples, and you uh, saw the practicalities. And also uh, you uh, had a chance to receive uh, some uh, legal uh, briefs uh, how it is organized here uh, in Ukraine. Uh, of course, we will uh, uh, follow up with other webinars on different topics, and we will be pleased to hear from you uh, your uh, questions and uh, uh, topics uh, to be covered during our next uh, webinars. Uh, also, everyone will get a link uh, to this uh, webinar in order to share with the colleagues and probably uh, with some friends. Uh, it's our mission to be useful for you. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you for being with us. Ciao. See you soon.